Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for September 11th, 2013. I'm Matt Gradwell from Uppercut Woodworks, and as you can see, where's my finger? The Hangout Toolbox is now working. Google fixed a bug. That's great. Um, this is Wood Chat, and uh, you can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com. My camera keeps autofocusing. Sorry about that. You can find me on Twitter at uppercutwood. Um, and if you're watching the video but you want to jump into the chat room, uh, head over to uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chat room and log in with your Twitter account. With me tonight, as always, is Chris Wong from Flare Woodworks. Hey, Chris. Hello, Matt. I've got a new whiteboard. Do you see that? I did. Whiteboard. I did. You, yeah. You can be like the guy that teaches uh, algebra on public TV. Perfect. So this is going to hang out right here in front of my computer, so... When I need to do a sketch, I can just whip that out and do a little sketch or something. Nice light whiteboard. So, um, Different yeah. than sketching on your computer, though. Oh, that's not as good, though. I don't know. I'm not, not as adept at that. I'd rather just throw a couple lines on there with some blue dry erase marker and then yeah. put it up on front of the screen there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Chris Wong here from Port Moody, BC. Find me on the web at flarewoodworks.com and check out my Twitter feed at at Flare Woodworks, where you find me. Right so on. Where are we going to start, Matt? Well, we got a couple topics. One is seminars you've been teaching. Yeah. Another one is book recommendations. Right. Um, and uh, techniques for stretching your creative side. Um, but we should tell people that we about the uh, telephone game design challenge that we're not doing this week. Yes. So um, we had Mr. Second Wind Woodworking Pete signed up to do the telephone game, and he had some work commitments he had to take care of, so he was unable to complete the design. So he's being penalized $5,000, and we're bumping him down to the end of the roster. So Pete is now slotted in the October 16th start date. Mm -hmm. and next up, uh, we have Paul Marcel. So I will shoot him an email with Bill Griggs' design and we'll have him uh, we'll see what he comes up with. It should be really interesting. He likes all kinds of curves and stuff in there and I don't know, it'll be it'll be interesting for sure. Right on. So um, if you want to join the telephone design game, let me know. Send me an email, Chris at flarewoodworks.com and I will get you signed up. The next available slot is October twenty third, the week starting that date. So starts on a Wednesday, ends on a Wednesday. And there really is no $5,000 cancellation fee, just so you know. <laughs> just, it's just $49.99 to cancel? Three easy payments of $49.99. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what do you want to start with? You want to start with books? You want to start Books. Books is a good place to start. Books is a good place to start. So I've been pulling some links. Um... And my mind went blank on Tom. Um, talking Fidgen. Fidgen. Yes. His new yes. book. The hand. Oh, he did the hand tool one. I can't. Um, I can't what it's called. He just did one, right? Yeah, I know. I know the one you talked about. So, we're talking about the books unplugged because uh, shop. the unplugged. Yes, that's right. Yeah, October first, twenty thirteen, is when it comes out. So, okay. um, who wants to start talking about books? you want to go? And then I, I can will. do one? So, yeah, we're, we're talking about books because Chad suggested he drop. He said, uh, hey, Matt, how about we talk about, uh, how about some book recommendations, yeah. old or new? So, yeah. if you want to talk about something here or you want us to talk about something, let us know. This is a, wood chat is driven by you. It's for you. Let us know on Twitter at uh, hashtag woodchat, and we'll do our best to accommodate you. So I thought that was a great idea. Um, books are always, I don't know, I'm a sucker for books. Yeah. Um, I was in Portland last month, middle of last month, and had to go to Powell's City of Books there. Mm -hmm. uh, if anyone doesn't know what Powell's is, it's probably the biggest bookstore on earth. It's Physical it's, bookstore. Yes, physical. Yeah, I think it's three or four stories high, and it takes up an entire city block. It's just massive. I think I spent 
three or four hours in there the first day, and then we went, we went back with a second day. Um, I got a big stack of books. I'll find a picture of all the books that I bought, but um, one book that I did buy, not at Powell's, but um, I actually went down to Portland specifically to get this book, and I just posted a review actually this morning. Mm -hmm. It is um, John Economaki's uh, Bridge Cities new book. It looks like this here. Oh, I didn't know you had one. Yeah, it just came out, uh, I guess, two weeks ago. So it's a beautiful hardcover book, and it, it's it got photos of John's work, both as a furniture maker, which he was earlier in his career, yeah, and also as a tool maker, as we now know him. So it's got lots of pictures and little anecdotes about uh, his, his progress, at how he got to where he is today. Lots of amazing, inspiring quotes. My one-sentence review was, this book was exactly as I would want my own. Hardcover, large, color photographs, insightful and interesting anecdotes, thought-provoking quotes, and above all, a thoroughly enjoyable and inspiring read. So, if you're interested in design you, at all... Did you just read that from your own website? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you're interested in design, tool making, or woodworking, I think that this is a definite book to get. Yeah. And you can order it right from Bridge City. Um, some libraries will, will have it a copy as well. So you can check mm -hmm. your library. They may may have a copy or maybe not. Depends how lucky you are. Oh, and the reason I went down to get the book was I got it signed. So I got it signed by John and all the other contributors to the book and the other staff. Wow. And yeah. Uh, John wrote in my book, if you don't become Canada's next best woodworker, keep trying. <laughs> nice. Okay, so that's my book review there, Matt. How about, how about one for you? Well, um... I have been tweeting links to books, so I'll go through all of them here in a second after I do this last tweet. Um, so the other question was, you know, how can you stretch um, your design and your creative side? So a couple of the book, one of the books is, well, I'll just go through them. Um, the first one is a book that is... I guess, out of print, but you can still get it. It's called The Old Way of Seeing. Right. And that was recommended to you by someone on which out, wasn't it? Yeah, and I can't remember who. Um, that that's, actually been, that's actually been really great. I'm not done with it yet. Um, but basically, um, it's mostly about architecture design, okay. but it totally applies. Um, and, it, and it actually, it's not even just the architecture of a house. It's also when you look at a street, how pathetic they can look sometimes or how good they can look sometimes because okay. houses placed together have to kind of fit. Mm -hmm. um, you don't put a big stucco house by a, by a um, Cape Cod on the same block and have that look rational. Um, but uh, the author draws a lot of lines so you can see um, window placement and and it's really interesting because you look at some of these pictures of these houses and you just go, that just looks good. And it's not fancy. It just it looks like it's put together well. So the, way, the, the best way I explain this to people when I talk about the book is they've actually done studies about faces and where things should be placed on a face to make people think it looks good. And when you place things... Um, a little bit incorrectly, mm -hmm. it really kind of makes people go, ah. Yeah. Um, and it's actually something that um, comes through even in my old field, which was video games, which they called the Uncanny Valley. Okay. It can make video game characters look really good, but there's mm -hmm. still something about them that's just not right. Okay. And a lot of times it's where the, the, the eye position mm -hmm. or even the position of their pupils, are they looking at you or not? Wow. Okay. Um, and so there's a lot of subtle hints and design cues that people pick up on uh, subconsciously 
that they're making a decision about whether they like the design or don't like the design. And so much like the face research, this, this isn't based off the face research, it just sounded similar to me when I, when I read the examples. Um, he exposes what some of those things are. Okay. And, and it's the, more ple pleasing. Is the book helping you see these things? Is that what it's giving to you? Annoyingly so. <laughs> so my wife is in the market. She wants to buy a, a new house. I've uh, told her my requirement for the new house is that I can have a dedicated shop, not a garage shop. <laughs> my God, I'm picky. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it, it actually is, it makes you critique everything. Mm. Um, another book like that that makes you crit critique everything that I read back when I ran um, a software usability group in games was by a guy named Don Norman, The Design of Everyday Things. Actually, do I have it? I don't have it here. Okay, I think I've heard of that. I didn't buy it, though. I don't have, I don't have it, but I have, a different, I have a different book that is kind of, <laughs> kind of relevant. Uh, but anyway, he talked, he, he goes into the design considerations by Japanese toilet makers, uh, doorknobs, <laughs> zippers, and how yeah, how so many things in our day-to-day -day lives are poorly designed, and we put up with it. <laughs> and you don't realize that yeah. everything you experience that there's so many things that you experience day to day that actually should be bugging the hell out of you, because you've just you've been worn down by their repetitive yeah. crappiness. And you've decided, and you've worked and you just around. Accept it. You've built muscle memory to deal with how things suck. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's a good one. The design of everyday things by Don Norman. Um, that one sounds, yeah, yeah. I think there's a level at which, when you know that much, then you start to see things differently, and you start to find faults and things that you might not have otherwise seen. Yeah. So uh, the I think other that's, thing that's he brings up in there, <laughs> the other thing he brings up there that's pretty cool, is how subtle changes. Here I'm tweeting. I'll, I'll tweet a link to that book. How subtle changes to design um, can really help improve the functionality. So here's a weird example. Yes. Um, I, I believe it was in the Netherlands. At the they were building a big, beautiful new airport. And somebody said, you know what I hate about airports? I go in to use the men's restroom, and it's like everybody pees on the floor. How do we solve okay. that? And there was a lot of expensive proposals around urinals that go all the way to the floor and drains and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And they just, all they did was they laser etched a fly on the porcelain <laughs> inside the urinal uh -huh. by, where the, by where the drain is in the in the uh -huh. urinal itself. Yeah. And they found that all men are little boys. Yeah. And they pee on the fly, and the mm. amount of pee on the floor was like reduced ninety eight percent or something crazy. So. Wow. So that's a that's a good book. Um, but that's a mm. subtle that's a subtle thing that doesn't involve um, do anything cra crazy with plumbing. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that's the design of everyday things, and that's um, the old way of seeing. The next one is by hand and by eye. Okay. Um, from George Walker yes. and Tolpen. That's the new one. Yep, not done with that yet. There is an electronic version that you can download from lostartpress.com. Um, There's also a seminar or a class that they're teaching. At Port Townsend School of Woodworking, which I'm really trying to get into because that's two, three hours away from me, and I want to go next summer, and I, to do it, I have to convince my wife to stay to stay in that Port Townsend with me, but I would love to go and meet George Walker, because when I built my um, Thomas Walnut dresser, he actually commented on it, okay. that he liked it, so, mm -hmm. I'd, I, and I'd love to take my book and have him autograph it. But that's a great book, and one of the things that comes through in these books is that there are people who think they aren't great designers, but much like woodworking, there are techniques and practices that you can um, do and a process you can go through, not only just to improve the way you cut hand cut dovetails, but also to improve your designs. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be Dale Chihuly artsy fartsy yeah. 
it's actually a process you can go through. So that's pretty cool. Um, then the next ones are actually about uh, woodworking technique. So, and 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 the, the first one I'm going to talk about has really pretty pictures. Uh, Thomas Mosier's How to Build Shaker Furniture. Okay. Rob Boas told, turned me on to that book. Um, I have the big hardcover one with the beautiful pictures. Nice. And it's pretty cool. Um, trying to not really do too much shaker, but it's still pretty amazing and beautiful and um, it's a it's a it's, it's a great beautiful book with beautiful pictures. Now um, I want to jump in with a question. Yeah. Um, I am completely sick and tired of technique books. I usually don't even open them up. Is, is this? Do you think that this is a book that I might be interested in, or what sets um, it apart? What makes it? So I good? mostly look at the pictures. Okay. And so you're not. He does have drawings in the back, and it's less about technique. It's mostly about. Okay. He, he does talk about how you could build it, but he doesn't tell you here's how you hand plane really well or blah, 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 okay. blah, blah. Yeah. But I'll be honest, I yep. mostly look at the pictures and I say, wow, that's pretty cool. I like the proportions. What would I want right. to do with okay. that? Right? Okay. Um, one of the topics gotcha. that you were thinking about talking about today was um, wood selection. Yes. And the wood in, in his pieces is... Right. It's all like museum quality wood, right? I mean, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the, the yeah. finish really brings it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then you're not going to like the next two then. Um, <laughs> Jim Tolpin's new traditional word, woodworker. Like you that said... One, that one looked, looked a little interesting. I haven't paged through it, but from the description it sounded like it was worth looking at any, at least. Yes. Um, the intro says if you're, if, you're, if you're more interested in working with wood rather than just machining it, mm -hmm. so... Um, it's kind of like uh, it, it's kind of like I think it's going to be kind of like Mark's hybrid woodworking book, um, but it's mostly about hand tools because it talks about you can forget the dust masks and face shields and all that stuff, um, which is interesting because that's not how Jim Tolpin started, right? Mm, right, uh, right, yeah. But I find myself because I'm not woodworking all the time. Yeah. You get rusty, and so there's times where I'll be sitting in the shop going, "How am I going to do that?" When the truth is, I know how to do it. I just have temporary memory loss. Yeah. And so being able to flip through things and, and right. is great. Yeah. And then the next the next book I don't own but I want to is Tom Fidgen's Unplugged Woodshop book. Um, because it's got projects, and I keep telling myself that one of these days I'm going to take a sabbatical, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to build all the projects in a book. Like I want yeah. to do um, maybe um, maybe all the projects in uh, Joiner's Apprentice. Wow! Right. Uh, wow. I would love to be able to take the time to do that. So. <laughs> so those are my books. Okay. Some on I've got design, a couple. Some on architecture. Some on projects and techniques. So. Uh, one of the Tolpin books that I owned that I thought was really good was uh, Jim Tolpin's Woodworking Wit and Wisdom. Uh, this is the one that I haven't heard much about. I've never heard anyone talk about it. Um, it was actually a book that was given to me as a birthday present, and it's, it's a fun read. Um, mm -hmm. it's, not a lot, it's not heavy on the text. It's basically a couple sentences with some, I don't, I guess they're kind of, it's, it's his wisdom. They're not, I don't really want to call them tips or techniques, but it's, just good habits and things like don't make your shop too big and I don't know you get you, you gotta look through it it's a it's a fun yeah. book to look at fun book to read um, it's not gonna teach you how to do woodworking yeah but, but uh, I don't know it's one that I like having on my bookshelf um, now one of the one of the books that I have read and keeps being brought up again and again by myself and by other people is um, it's called The Nature and Art of Workmanship by David Pye. Mm -hmm. Have you read this book, Matt? Mm -mm, never heard of it. Okay. Never heard of it? No. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Let me think it. Um, so I, I've read it twice. I'll have to read it again, too. It's, um, it's one of those books where every time you read it, you get more and more out of it.
nature. What, what it talks about from my two readings of it and from the discussion around it, it talks about, um, okay, what David Pye does is he's, he makes these bowls mm -hmm. and he carves the grooves in them by hand. Um, he's got, I think he's got a jig for it too, but it's, the term that he uses is workmanship of risk. And what that means is with every step that he makes, he could totally screw it up. Yeah. And he, the book is, it talks about the value of that and, um, it, it just resonates with me in the work that I do because I think that most of us, most of us can relate to that. Yeah. Um, there's another book that I'm trying to remember. It's about green, shadows of light or what the heck is it? I'll think of it. Uh, what is it? And it's supposed to be great green and green pictures. Um, and I really wish I could find it. Um, Chad is asking for a link to the Joiner's Apprentice book. I will get him one. I will get him one. If you guys remember, if you guys know what I'm talking about when I talk about the green and green book, that's like shadows and light. And <laughs> sorry, I sound. Uh, yeah. kind of maybe rings a bell, but not quite. Yeah. So um, David Pye also wrote a second book on this on a similar topic. It's called The Nature and Aesthetics of Design, and this is a book that I don't own and I haven't read. I'm wondering if. Anyone else has read it and what they think of it, if they have. Oh, it's not the Joiner's Apprentice. It's the Joiner and Cabinet Maker. I'll post a link. Um, the, the guy in the book is a Joiner's Apprentice. That's a Lost Art Press book, I do believe, right? Yeah. Um, and if you get the one with DVD, it comes with plans, which is pretty cool. So you can make all the stuff and the sources on where to get hand cut nails and stuff like that. Um, gosh dang it, I'm 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 ticking myself off that I can't think of that. Hmm. Poems of wooden light. Well, Matt tries to find his book. There, I'll, I'll run through a uh, couple other books that I would recommend. Um, when people ask me what. Wood books yes, like that's it. Poetry. Poems of Wooden Light. I'll post a there link. There you go. Um, when people ask me for books that are that I find inspiring, I always go go back to the 500 series by Lark Books. Um, they've got a, I think five of them around woodworking. Um, 500 Wood Bowls is one title. 500 Tables, 500 Chairs, 500 Cabinets. Are these pictured? Mostly pictures? Yes, they're pictures with the only text is a it's like is an introduction, and then after that, the only text is the artist name, the piece name, and the date, and the materials and size. Yes, yeah, so those, those I'm I'm gravitating towards those books lately. Yes, me too. And and putting them out yeah. as coffee table books. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah, th these ones don't hold open very well because they're yeah. they're just really thick books, but they're great. Lots of ideas. When I when I'm trying to work on a chair design, for example, and I I'm looking for kind of a different base or something. I'll look through there and I'll try and find a similar base or see if there's anything that's even been done that's similar. And um, I find it easier than looking through the internet and 500 chairs is a pretty good sampling. It's by no means complete, but uh, yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Are there any uh, other books like that that you know of? Well, there's a couple, I think, but I can't think of them. Um... There's been some similar books, not specific about furniture that I've looked at. One is, honestly, it was a picture of old. It was a picture book of old barns. Okay. And um, I, I probably spent two and a half hours looking through it, but I can't remember what it was called. There is a series of books, and it's there. The books show the work of an exhibition, and it's called Freshwood. 
Okay. Um, it's I want to say it's a competition of it's school students. I can't remember if it's um, high school and post secondary. Um, I'm not finding it. Oh, here it is. Um, this so they're volumes. Freshwood volume three is mm -hmm. the link that I found. Right Uh, student woodworking competition. It's it's at part of the AWFS fair mm. in Las Vegas. So some really high end work there. You, um, the books are on. They're on the more expensive side for what you get. You get fewer pictures. Um, but the quality of work is really good, and, and you get a good variety as well. You get some period stuff, and then some more. Uh, some higher levels, um, some not higher level, but some more right. contemporary stuff. I sent a link there into Twitter as well. Um, that's Freshwood is volume one, two, and three. Um, one book that I picked up in Portland that sitting, and it I haven't got into it yet, but it's a book. It looks to be a book on what makes a chair and how to design chairs. That's, that's what I get out of it. Um, you can have a read of the description here. I'm going to send one in. Um, it's by Peter Opsvik. What's it called? What's it called? Rethinking Sitting. <laughs> and you'll find a link in Twitter there if you look. I'm hashtag woodchat. So that's what I'm looking forward to getting into. Um, yeah, I carried all these books back with me. I, I'm crazy. I took the train down. So, I to, yeah. so the train's at one end of Portland, and my hotel's at the other end of Portland. And so you walk? Yeah, so I had to carry these books like 12 blocks or something, along with everything else I had. Um, I didn't think there was going to be so many books about chairs. I think I took them all. <laughs> 50 chairs that changed... The world. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay. Um, from Port, from Powell's, I got most. I got a bunch of books on chairs. Um, I think that rethinking sitting is the most interesting looking one, though. Yeah, I definitely recommend the Lark series of books, so the 500 series. This is, I. You go to Amazon, you look for books on chairs. My God! Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! I did that. I did that earlier. I was looking at my my free shipping. Thing. Yeah. So, oh, here, here's a good book. Um, I've actually got a whole list of recommended readings on my website. I'm kind of going through that as a refresher. But um, when I started woodworking, probably like most woodworkers, um, I was into arts and craft furniture. Believe it or not. Yeah. Um, I picked up people this people book. Shaker, I, sh I can't. People do a lot of shaker and mission in the, in the early days. Mm -hmm. New um, workers do. So I bought this book. Um, this book is called Arts and Craft Furniture from Classic to Contemporary uh, by Kevin O'Dell and Jonathan Binson. And this is a book I would recommend to any woodworker, I think. Um, Even if they're not... It talks the about... Wow. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I still like this book. I'm not going to let it go. Um, it, it talks about the characteristics of the furniture, like mm -hmm. um, how, how there's a machine-made versus the hand the handmade look. And um, one more woodworker, I'm trying to remember his name, um, he he wanted to make he wanted to make it look like his work wasn't machine made, so he deliberately made rough tool marks in his work and left them there. Sid mm -hmm. Sid Barnsley is his name. So even though we're well past the, or even though I'm not interested in arts and craft furniture and making it, the ideas the same ideas still apply. Wait, say, wait, 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 what? What? <laughs> Even though I'm not interested in building arts and craft furniture, 
there's a lot of ideas in the book that still apply to my to woodworking in general. Gotcha. It, it uses not to, my your, mind not to your design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, maybe or as maybe. well, but um, more proportion, and, not form. Yeah, and the trestle table is a classic form, anyways. But it it kind of uses arts and craft furniture as a vessel to talk about these other elements of woodworking. Hmm. I'm going to have to read that one again. I read that one twice, and I'll probably read it again. Hmm. Which, which, Out of all the books you've read, which one's the most influential? That one's right up there. Um, Arts and Craft Furniture is right up there. Um, with that, um, Sam Maloof, Woodworker, was another good one. Kind of showed me a different way of working of living. It's, it's a, kind of about his lifestyle, right? Yeah. Um, Wharton Escherich's book as well, uh, The Journey of a Creative Mind. That one was good, but I wouldn't rate it quite as high. Um, I think those, off the top of my head, those two are, are it. Um, I'd have to, I, I can't think of anything else right now. Okay. So let me ask you this question now. Do you have any autofocus? Do you have any movies that you would recommend to woodworkers? Um, no. Um, really? I'm not a not a big movie guy. Um, I saw a review on another blog for I think I was the literary workshop um, where Steve recommended a. A movie on the making of a uh, was it a Steinway? Steinway. Steinway. Yeah. Piano. Yeah. yeah I, think a, rec I, I think that. Um, there's a I documentary on on online about uh, yeah. them making Steinway. It's short, actually. The one I saw. Okay. Like, oh, okay. I did. I did see that. I wonder if there's a longer video as well. A longer there might movie. Be. Um. So Matt, since you asked the question, do you have something in mind? Thanks, Chris. You're feeding me. Um, I think there's a great movie out there for woodworkers, but it actually has nothing to do with woodworking. It just has to do with um, the amount of hours that it takes to get good at something and how practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And I've talked about it before, but it's Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Right, yes. And this old sushi master who is just at the top of his craft and how he makes guys redo stuff if they get it wrong. And, I mean, it's okay. it's it's a, it's a fascinating... I mean, you have to read the movie because they... It's subtitled, right? Okay. It's all in Japanese, yeah. but yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty darn good. But I've also seen... I know Kari Holtman used to post some of them old videos from like Scandinavia of um, guys making clogs and stuff like that and I find those I find those absolutely fascinating um, but as yeah, far as I have, movies I have go, a really hard I have a hard time watching um, why is that um, do you recommend I don't know I I guess when I'm at the computer, I feel like I can do a billion different other things, and I don't don't really want to watch it. I don't want to sit there and watch a video. Yeah, I usually watch them laying in bed on my phone with headphones in. <laughs> All right. Until I until yeah. I can fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. So would you would you recommend getting a big plate of sushi before you sit down for that movie, or is popcorn good? Uh, popcorn's good, um, but you know, I'll never turn down a big plate of food. Not really sushi. I'm not really a fish guy, but there's lots of other Japanese food I'll eat. Mm. So, yeah. the interesting point in the movie is that the guy's son's apprentice under him, mm -hmm. and he didn't let his son go to the fish market and pick out the fish. Uh -huh. um, I think until the guy was like 50. Wow. And the dad had a heart attack or something, and so finally, oh, okay. okay, son, I'm going to trust you to go to pick, pick the fish now. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, hmm. is that a, when he came I mean, back, his son was cutting the fish too thick, and he criticized him for it. <laughs> is that a new a new movie or is it? No, it's an old. Very old. It's, yeah. 
been around for a while. I think I watched it on Netflix. Um, I posted a posted a link um, in 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 Twitter, but yeah, it was a Tribeca Film Festival Festival 2011. Okay. So it's been around for a while, but it's basically you know the work you have to do to be world class. Right. So. Yeah. Oh, I will sit down and watch that on your recommendation app. You should watch it. I think it's yeah. pretty cool. He's just a character, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. The, I know there's been at least one movie which I missed a large part of the story because I was looking at the woodwork. <laughs> <laughs> what movie was that? I can't remember. Um, there was It was a Steve Martin and Steve Martin and Alec Baldwin. And I can't remember who else was in it, but there was this one scene where they open a drawer and they've got, it's a, they've got these nice wooden compartments there and the dividers are nicely rounded over on top of mahogany or something. I'm looking at that and I'm missing what's in the drawer which is kind of a big part of the storyline. I can't remember the rest of it. but Was it, it's complicated? Yeah, I think so. That sounds right. With Meryl Streep? Yeah, 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 that's it, yeah. Okay, so you watch chick flicks. Apparently I do. That's cool. If they have nice woodwork. That's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, but I I think Gerald Dreams of Sushi is, like, no matter what you're in, if you want to be good at something, it's a good um, thing to watch. If somebody, you know, whatever they want to be, it's like, okay, well, let me let me show you what it's going to take to be really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, all right, so there were some other topics. The other yeah. one was how do you stretch your creative and design um, skills? Mm -hmm. And I think that dovetails um, into a discussion oh, we wanted okay. to have, which is around sketching. Yeah. Um, I want to start by saying if you aren't already following Steve Ramsey's blog, he has... The, um, every Tuesday, he has he's posting something in what he's calling the Inspiration Project, and he's asking woodworkers who, to simply answer the question in whichever form they like. What inspires? And he's got some really good responses. Um, the latest was uh, Todd Clippinger, as we all know. Um, we know him quite well on just from being who he is, uh, the American Crafts and Workshop, and he put together a good video about where he gets his inspiration from and also on sketching, and um, he made some really good points in the video. One of the most important uh, being that your sketches, when you put a sketch down on paper, you're not looking for a fine drawing, just something to convey the idea. Yeah. So you can look at it and kind of uh, analyze it, and then you can either build on it or come back to it later and know what you're, know what it was. Um, I don't have too much to talk about sketching, but Chad and I were talking a bit about it before. Um, my sketches, they're quite crude. They use a lot of arrows and labels just so I know what I'm drawing. Yeah. Leg. No, not quite like that, but oh, I'll put an arrow in label dovetails or like a moving leg or I'll yeah. make a note saying this is, this should be tapered to do this or um, I don't have my sketchbook here, but um, there is a page of sketches on my blog somewhere. It's in the tel in the uh, one of the conversation chair posts that I sketched. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting that that chair. I've seen it. Um, it seems to be gaining traction. That design. Um, we had Andy Brownell on a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about his his conversation bench. Just out of nowhere, it seemed. Yeah. So um, he's working on his bench. I'm working on the conversation chair, which I don't know if I'll get to build anytime soon. And um, there, there are some other people working on that design as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a, not a new idea, but it's an enduring one. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting to me, anyhow. Yeah, I think um, I've seen... Um, 
I think it was in a library where they had chairs set up like that. Oh, okay. But for reading. Yeah. But yeah. even even though you were even though you were back to back, you actually yeah. weren't. You yeah. could actually see the face of the person that was sitting the other direction because there was a little bit of offset. Um, yeah. Which usually, was cool. usually the seat is right in line, then you have backrests on opposite sides yeah. of the seat. Yeah. Yeah. So what other ideas for uh, stretching your creative? Um, do stuff. Sketch and build and make mistakes and yeah. um, try things you don't think will work or try things that you think are just insane. Yeah. I think sketching uh, is, is probably core. It's the cheapest and it yeah. takes less time. Yep. Um, and then there's other things like... Um, don't just sit down in an empty room and sketch. Um, maybe take uh, a, maybe, well, I'm just uh, to help people. Maybe go somewhere and where there's visually interesting things. Yeah. And now, try and sketch okay. those. A lot of people go, you know, um, go on a walk outside to sketch. Yeah. What I used um, to do in high school, I used to take a pad of paper and I sit down wherever it was. Yeah. And it could be an interesting place, it could be a not not interesting place. And I'd sit there for my lunch break and eat my lunch and I'd just sketch things and make them into furniture or designs or boxes yeah. or something. Yeah. So I remember this one one place I was sitting was in the library, not a whole lot to see there. Um, I was looking at the round concrete columns that supported the roof. Mm -hmm. And I ended up drawing that into um, a couple jewelry boxes and um, had some hatches and things that opened. But I, I think that you can also get creativity by just reinterpreting one thing. And yeah. if you sit there long enough, you can reinterpret it over and over and over again. And eventually you'll come up with something that's totally different and maybe a, a winner. Mm -hmm. So there's some exercises that you can find online or in books that'll kind of along the lines of what you said, which is um, right. go somewhere where you're not going to be distracted by your family or the TV or the computer or the phone. Take a take a pad of paper. It doesn't need to be graph paper. These aren't architectural drawings. Yeah. And then look at two things. And in your case, it might be a chair. Like in the library, it might have been um, a chair and that concrete column. Mm -hmm. And then Try and see how you can put them together, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, how could I blend the concrete column and the chair, or yeah. add, yeah. you know? Um, but there's different exercises you can do that people are always taught to think so logically that you have mm -hmm. to go through exercises to get a little bit loose. I'll, I'll call it. And it's yeah. really tough yeah. for us. It's really tough for us engineer types. Yeah, there's there's this idea that it's easier to write when you're drunk, and yeah. what it really is, it's it's uh, removing that um, say in inhibition that um, uh, it's kind of removing that fear of doing something not so great, just kind of putting it yourself out there. Yep. And you're a little bit less afraid after you've had a, a drink or two. So. Yep. It's not. You not that we're recommending drink. alcoholism. You, you don't need to, yeah, you don't need to be drinking to get this design, but you just need to get into that state of mind. Yep. This will help. Rum helps. There you Rum's go. Good motivator. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, um, we, a lot of times we condition ourselves out of being creative and curious, and so you have to exercise your way back into it. Mm -hmm. um, or use chemicals. That yeah. works too. Yeah, I, I, um, I liked what Bill Bill Griggs did last week. In um, I can't remember if he actually. Well, he got me thinking. Anyways, one way that you could come up with some really neat ideas is to take a centuries-old design, or even yeah. millennium-old design, and put a fresh spin on it. Yeah. So. 
you could make take a high boy and put or I don't know take something Queen Anne and get rid of the the cabriole legs put tapered legs on it yeah and that'll look silly so then you keep going yeah you change the backrest from the carved whatever frame into I don't know a tapered a trapezoid or something yeah. and then I don't know just one thing after the other yeah and then also think about different materials different materials yeah yeah um, so when Bill Griggs brought that up I, I liked it because I, I, I meant to bring up what he recommended is exactly backwards of what the steampunk people are doing making something new they take something old, modern and make it look old and yeah. Jules Verne right yep um, and that's that's creative too mm -hmm. but taking something taking something old like that Egyptian uh, chair and turning it into a modern table is is, is pretty cool too so um, is that like nuclear punk yeah yeah but it, it would it is interesting to you know whatever's around you say okay I'm gonna sketch that and then yeah. put some twist on it like I'm gonna make it look yeah I'm gonna make it look uh, Asian or whatever and 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 see what you can do and then it, I think the key thing is don't take a ruler. You're not there to do a measured yes. drawing or have perfectly straight lines. And um, we do the same. We do the, We have the same thing when we do brainstorming for product design. When you have an idea, you go with it, and you don't worry about judging it as you're going. Yeah. And just yeah. finish it, put it away, and do something else. And then you can come back later if you want mm -hmm. and decide what you like and what you don't like. So what I do when I sketch is I use a pen instead of a pencil, so I'm never tempted to go back and try and erase something and try and tweak it. If I want to tweak it, I'll just redraw it next to it. Yeah. And that way I have a progression, and I can see in those failed ones, or the ones I like less, I can see why they work not as well as the next one. Yeah. Or I can see if the, the proportion changes. So in my sketchbook, sometimes you'll see five of the same, very similar chairs, for example and there's only a slight difference between them and that difference wasn't even intended I was trying to, I was roughly very crudely trying to draw the same thing five yeah. times yeah but just the variation from drawing in two seconds shows me different proportion shows me a different line that I might like yep yep um, early on in my designing I used to I was inspired a lot by mechanisms so I look at I look at a mechanism and try and figure out how we can work it into a piece of furniture. So in my shop here, I'm standing at my computer here, my whole chisel monitor is right in front of me next to the computer here, and I'm looking at the rack and pinion system that pull the arm to make the, the head come down. And I don't know, you could you could have a, a drawer like open like that. You pull a lever yeah. and the drawer comes out or uh, just mechanisms and they're everywhere around us. Um, yeah. And they can inspire you. Every everything from the the latch of a door to the motion of a of a sliding door or something, or how a wheel goes round, or just just watch how, how things how different things interact. There's a um. I'm trying to find the book now. An introduction. I think you started typing and your microphone auto muted Matt. Right, I'm looking for a book. There's a book. Um, it's about simple machines. Simple machines. Levers, gears, yeah. mm. pulleys, things like that. Okay. Um, the, those those kind of mechanisms, as you said, yeah, um, are can be pretty interesting. Uh, Lee, Lee Valley has a couple of books on mechanisms. Um, I think one of them is called Five Hundred. Your audio cut out. Okay. Um, there is Lee Valley has a couple books on mechanisms on designs, and um, mm -hmm. here here they are. Um, there's two of them in the series, I do believe. Um, 970 mechanical appliances and 1800 mechanical movements and devices. Links are coming to. You. And those books are really interesting. If you want to start making 
your own um, catches, latches, yep. um, handles, vices. Things, you know. Yeah, I mean, any, anything like that. Um, interesting ways to open drawers. Um, and what people don't realize is that, you know, you, you can go to your local mom-and-pop hardware store and get all different kinds of springs and pulleys, and there's that aisle that has all the little drawers, and you can get tons of different things, and you can do some pretty cool designs there. Um, I was brainstorming a way to have um, a desk that has, a, like, a secret agent drawer. Okay, you yeah. kind of reach under and, and, and yeah. find a find a button, and when you push the button, you don't have to pull the drawer open. It kind of slings open. I think that would yep. be kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and all that stuff is, all the hardware for that is available, mm -hmm. and all the designs for that are in these yeah. simple machines books. Yeah. I get a lot of inspiration looking through the hardware catalog of Lee Valley. Yeah. A little. Yeah. The buttons and the latches and think, oh, how can I incorporate Weights that? and pulleys and latches yeah. and all kinds of stuff, so. And I, I'm... I don't know if it, it's abuse, but I, I misuse a lot of things. I'll take something that's designed to do this, and I'll turn it upside down and use it for something that's not at all intended to be to be used for. Yeah. I guess that's kind of the inventor gene. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool. It's it's, it's fun. It's fun to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, there was one. There was a YouTube video of a guy who built a. Replica, gosh dang it, I wish I had the link. A replica of an old desk that had lots and lots and lots of these things. Do you remember that video? No, I'm just playing. Compartments and levers and weights and sliding this and. Oh. Yeah, that was like a, like a tall secretary, was it? I think so. And then the, the other one I was thinking of was it was featured in, in uh, on, online fine woodworking. It was a desk that, that I think there was a keyboard somewhere hidden in there, or a piano. I can't remember. I think it was a desk with a hidden keyboard, and mm -hmm. if you play this, play the song, then the secret compartment opens up. That's very cool. That's very cool. So, other ways to stretch people's design capabilities? Absolutely. Play the telephone game. That's a good one. Um, yeah, just keep. Keep sketching, keep drawing, keep trying new things, and keep looking at things and a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, go for a walk and take your time and just stop and look at stuff. Um, and I'll try and imagine how it can be used, how the pattern of like. If you, I did a video on inspiration a little while ago for Steve Ramsey of Mere Mortals there, and I was looking at the dirt on a sign, thinking this, this the pattern of dirt. Could be an interesting effect on a tabletop, for example, or something. Or it's looking at just different juxtapositions of different materials together, and just things that I find in the man-made world that make me think. I, I read a quote: um, "The mind is like a parachute; it's only good if it's open." So that's definitely true when it comes to design and trying to find new design. Yeah, there's a there's another quote about um, about open minds, about having them too open. Um, your brain, yeah. The problem the problem with too open, or no, yeah, something like about your brain's falling out. What is it? Um, no, Aristotle said it is the mark of an educated uh -huh. mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And so the way I would translate that for woodworkers <laughs> is. It is a yeah. mark of a good designer to be able to look at a design and say, "Yeah, that's not going to work. Let's yeah. keep yeah. let's keep designing." Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Right. Were there other topics we were going to do? Oh, your seminars. I think we can wait for another week for that. Okay. Um, we're doing pretty well here. One thing that I do. I think would really help me in my design and something that I haven't quite figured out yet but I've been working on it. I want to have some kind of three-dimensional building material that I can work with. I can make furniture very quickly, like just mold it with my hands. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I'm, I, I kind of had this idea of a wireframe, and you can buy wire mesh and fold it and oh, bend yeah. it into the shapes, but um, wasn't quite what I'm looking for, I don't think. Um, I don't know if clay is maybe what I'm looking for. Um, I was kind of thinking of some wireframe thing that I can bend and manipulate, but clay is starting to sound more and more like what I'm looking for. But I don't know. Does anybody design with clay? I do not. Yeah. Closest thing I do to clay is uh, pink foam insulation that I cut up and hot glue gun together. Yeah. I have to get some clay for myself. I want to get some really soft wood that I can just kind of bend and move around and rearrange. I need a 3D printer in my hand. Build. Yes, you do. So what? why is this design more suited to wire mesh or clay versus cutting uh, up cardboard and taping it together? Seems like a lot of work. Mm. I want to be able to reform my prototype with minimal fuss. Mm -hmm. And a wire mesh seems like a lot of work to reform. I don't know. Maybe I need some... I don't know. Legos? Yeah, I just, I just think that maybe it's a Lego. Yeah. Matt, do you ever wake up in the morning with an idea? Like you just wake up like like that, and you've got an idea, and you you've got you know how everything's gonna fall, how everything's gonna go. All the time. I <laughs> yeah, was up at that, four this morning, and I solved a big problem at work. It wasn't an, it wasn't a woodworking question; it was a work question. Yeah. But all the time, like the way I used to write papers for school was. <laughs> research, 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 read, read, research, 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 read, read. Um, try and start writing the paper. Maybe get an outline. Yeah. Wake up in the middle of the night one night and write the paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. Mm. I used to write, write my I feel papers. Like all so I, have I, to do is I have to put the ingredients in there and just let yeah, it cook yeah, for a while. Yeah. And then the, the little the little thing come pops out and says turkey's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I woke up a couple of weeks ago with uh, an idea for a workbench, and I guess we'll talk about that in, in another show. Um, yeah. But I've got this. If you know me, you kind of have an idea of where my workbench would go. It probably look, you know, it looks nothing like any other workbench you've seen. So, um, yeah. come back another week and hear all about it. Is it uh, upside down? Not quite, no. Um, Three legs? There's no. It's going to be big and heavy. It's going to have a slab. It'll have some moving components to it. Um, the biggest thing I work with a lot of live edge material that you can't clamp yeah. by the edges. So I need a way of working the surface without clamping the, the edges. So in different angles as well, be able to work the edges without clamping it in a big vise or something. Is it a, is it a giant pattern maker's vise? Um, I guess you could loosely define it as that. Okay. I'm also trying to redesign the, the vices for the bench because there, I don't think there's a single vise on the, on the market that I actually 100% like. Um, I've been using a twin screw, um, like a Rubo style vise that's built into my workbench. Yeah. Um, for the past year and a bit, and it's a pretty good vise, but it has some shortcomings. Um, the Tucker, I think, is a little bit better, the Pattern Maker's vise, but it still has some shortcomings as well. And I haven't seen a design of a bench that really um, does everything as well as I want it to. So I'm working on some stuff like some of that. Mm. Um, I've been thinking about it lots and have to get some parts and need to get some bench building materials in my shop here. And then I'll start to take shape. I, I'm hoping I can knock it together in a week or two. Mm -hmm. Probably next year. And it may have a CNC tape on the back. <laughs> Might have what? <laughs> it may or may not have a CNC table on the back of the bench. On the back, yeah. Like this way know. or this way? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, it'd pro probably be horizontal, but I don't know. Um, all these crazy ideas in my head. I don't know. 
What if it was just a big, uh, in the middle of the top of the bench had a big suction to hold mm. things down? That isn't a bad idea. I wonder if you can draw enough suction to hold a piece while you hand plane it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, can you can. You? Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. Um, so, when I was at Skills Canada... Um, remember Bill last week told us about those cranes? Yes, that's right, yeah. Carry yeah, them around, yeah, right? Yeah, the Bernoulli principle. Yeah, it's just um, one of those upside down, right? Yeah, huh. Uh, okay. Whew. That's an exciting idea. Um, here's one thing that... Let me, let me get one piece of wood here. I'll show you one of the problems that I face. Oh, Betty, Betty, I can show you a picture. Yeah. So far. Uh, Tumblr page. Um, as you guys probably know, I used to do tweet-alongs where I document every step of my process along the way. Um, I've moved over to Tumblr for that because, one, it publishes both to Twitter and to Facebook at the same time, and also it documents everything in an easy-to-reference form. So I have got this picture here coming. And okay, so I've got a picture here. I'm going to screen share it. Okay. So this this material is ash. It doesn't really matter what the material is. It's not really the point. But how I got these was I took a piece of ash that had a, a split down along the end grain, and I drove wedges in there and just split out a piece. Yeah. So it has... You did the fall one, edge thing. Yeah. So it's got a live edge all the way around, and most of the edges taper down to nothing, so they're very fragile. And the top edge is also live. So my problem here was how to flatten the, t the bottom side, which is flat. And I think that'd be near impossible to secure to a bench. Uh, if suction would work, that'd be terrific. Then you could use hand planes on it. Um, what I ended up doing was using the power jointer. Mm -hmm. I ran it across. That was pretty sketchy because the yeah, angled part was getting caught under the guard and under the fence. Yeah, that'll be really bad. Yeah, um, and also it's really hard to grip um, because you can't put a flat push block on there very effectively. Um, I don't know. This is one of the challenges that I face, and I have to be really creative or, I don't know, brave to do this kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. That suction thing, that... If if it can work, that's a really good idea. Why? Well, um, I'll have to do some more thinking on that. It could it could really work. Yeah, and that can you imagine that? Just a, a foot switch. Put your piece of material there. Touch yep. the foot switch. Yep. On it goes. You yep. have nothing impeding the top, which is a big thing for me. Yeah. Um, when I put things in the vise or put a hole down, I've got this thing sticking four inches above the workpiece, and I'm trying to get in there with the carving tool, and I'm, uh, that that, no, that vise is just in that. the way. Same with the clamp, and I was working on some low-profile clamps uh, or vices, clamps, vice, whatever, and what, yeah, from the bottom would be awesome. A power workbench. Yeah, you would need like you know. Uh, Either a compressor or a vacuum pump. You'd need a, yep. a, a suction cup. You might you might want a the, few, right? Go to the dollar store, get a few suction cups, and I'm good. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> or maybe Velcro. Velcro. Oh, cool. That's that's pretty strong, actually. Yeah, you can get industrial Velcro. Double stick tape. Yeah. Yeah, you never. You'll never know until yeah. you try. I'm going to do some research into into that vacuum idea there. Um, from my visit to Skills Canada and Festo, um, the sister company of Festool, um, 
the ventri Venturi principle isn't the best system to hold material down because what it does is actually pulls air into the ports. And the problem with that is if you have sawdust or lubricants or anything in the way there, it's going to get drawn in and gunk everything up. Yeah. So the Bernoulli principle is a little bit different. It doesn't has a I think it has a very low negative pressure, so it doesn't have those same problems. Mm. And that's what they use in sawmills. Mm -hmm. And of course they're dealing with rough lumber too, so that would work well I think to hold rough lumber down to my bench when I'm sawing or planing or whatever carving whatever work I have to do on there. Yep. Yeah. Yes, Adam, I am building a bench that really sucks. You gonna build it? I fully intend to. So hmm. I can really pare it down then if that's the case. I don't need a big thick top for bench dogs. No. Nope. I need a flat top and I need to have mass in the bottom. Okay, I'll spill it. I want to have a tilting top. Okay. A tilt tilting it. a tilting slash rotating top. That way I can just suck something right to the face of it and then I, I just rotate the bench like this and it can work on the end. Yeah. With the edge. Yeah. I can't wait to see how you con construct this contraption. Um, yeah. <laughs> or where you even Sketch. find the supplies and devices you need. Yeah. Um, I think we should wrap up wood chat pretty soon because I want to do some research. Yeah, let's do um, it. Eight thirty. We're already. If we off. have, yeah. If we have anybody here who knows about. Um, the Bernoulli principle and what's required to make that happen. I want to know. Let me know. I think you're going to be going to the internet and searching here pretty soon. Oh, I'm already there. All right. Let's wrap it up then so you can go geek out. Right. Need All right. Well, that was it then. That's Wood Chat for um, September 11th, 2013. I'm Matt Gradwell from Uppercut Woodworks. We do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific time. 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, if you would like to participate in the telephone design game, let us know at Uppercut Wood or at Flare Woodworks with hashtag WoodChat. Um, if you would want to participate in any of the design uh, design jams or know much about the Bernoulli principle, I'm sure Chris would love to have you. Yep. Um, even though the video is ending, WoodChat is 24/7, 365. If you've got a question or want to show off your work or uh, just need help or encouragement, um, send a tweet with hashtag WoodChat. One of the friendly WoodChatters will be more than happy to help you out. That's it for me. Again, I'm Matt Gradwell, and Chris, say goodbye, brother. All right. Good night, everybody. I will be up until uh, about 3 a.m. researching Bernoulli's principle and seeing what I can find for parts for my workbench. Right on. All right, everybody. Have a good night. See you next week.